In the fall of 2018, Lori Vallow was married to Charles Vallow. Together, they were raising two children while living in Arizona. 16-year-old Tylee, who Lori had with one of her prior husbands, and seven-year-old JJ, who they adopted from a member of Charles' family. Right around that same time, Lori started reading books written by a man named Chad Daybell. Chad was a married former gravedigger living in Idaho who claimed to have visions about the end of the world. On July 11, 2019, Lori's husband Charles was shot and killed by her brother Alex Cox, who claimed self-defense. Lori then moved to Idaho with her children. But when JJ's grandparents stopped getting calls from JJ, they got concerned and called police. When police came for a wellness check, Lori packed up and left Idaho. She was eventually arrested in Hawaii with Chad Daybell, but without her children. Chad and Lori were married. They got married nine days after Chad's wife, Tammy, died in their home. Investigators began a search for JJ and Tylee that ended in Chad's backyard. Now Chad and Lori are in jail, charged with the murders of Tylee, JJ, and Chad's wife, Tammy. Lori has also been implicated in the murder of her former husband, Charles. Both are facing the death penalty. I'm Vinny Politan, great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. This is a story unlike any other I have ever covered. You talk about, you know, it's got more, it's got as many layers as an onion, right? You gotta peel, no, this has like twice as many layers as any onion you've ever peeled. When we first learned of, of this story, and, and it began as a search for those children, specifically JJ, that's how this whole thing started. It took us about two months to really understand the depth of what was going on in the life of Lori, at that point, Vallow Daybell. Now she just goes by Lori Daybell. But we finally got there. And, and now this case is about these two people, at least the criminal case, Chad and Lori, the doomsday couple. Why the doomsday couple? Well, Chad was a, a so-called prophet who had these visions of the ends of days and, and, and he knew when it was gonna happen and he and Lori are, are, are gonna lead the masses after the end of the world and the second coming and all of that. The date he picked came and went, by the way. He was in jail at the time. Um, anyhow, her children go missing and, and they're not looking for them. And, and, we, and, and while they're missing, I mean, the bodies in this case just piling up. There's at least five, there's at least five, and arguably there could be more, but they're all saying natural causes on those other ones. You've got Charles uh, Vallow, Lori's husband, who was shot and killed by her brother, uh, but she's now been charged in that. You've got uh, Tammy, who is the former wife of Chad Daybell, who died in the home, in her sleep. How did that happen? Well. It was interesting because originally it was natural causes. Then when things started to unravel, all those layers of the onion, all of a sudden they exhumed the body of Tammy Daybell. And when they exhumed the body of Tammy Daybell, that same day, Alex Cox, Lori's brother, suddenly dies. The one who killed Charles Vallow, admittedly, he was claiming self-defense, but he's down and out, died on the toilet. But let's get to the two that really, really matter here. Obviously, everyone matters, but this murder trial and the evidence and what we want to talk about tonight is about J.J. and Tylee and where they were found in that backyard of Chad Daybell. The bodies and the evidence that have been uncovered there, crucial in this case, absolutely crucial. There's the story, there's the motive, there's the recordings, the witnesses, but there's also the forensics. 
which will be so necessary to prove this case. I want you to take a listen to um, some of the local news reports when those bodies were found in Chad's backyard. Here's what we can see. Uh, there are multiple police officers here. There's at least one canine dog. It looks like uh, there is an area of focus in the backyard. They have set up uh, three or four blue canopy tents. They have taped off the backyard. And that seems to be the area of focus right now. We're across the field from Chad Daybell's home, and we're going to zoom way, way in so that you can kind of see where investigators have been outside all day long. Investigators from the Rexburg Police Department, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, as well as the FBI evidence response team. Now, uh, Rexburg Police did say they're out here serving the search warrant in relation to the case of JJ and Tylee, the kids missing since September, and they confirm they have found human remains on this property. Shortly after the remains were discovered, uh, Chad Daybell was taken into custody and booked into the Fremont County Jail. We noticed they were having um, a few bonfires that were kind of out of the ordinary. So they had a bonfire, a big bonfire last fall, and they had two or three big bonfires this spring. When I returned to that area, they had already dug down and located what appeared to be a, a mass of burnt flesh and charred bone. The amount of duct tape that was covering the body. Okay. Uh, where was that duct tape located? On the head, arms, and feet. Gruesome discovery. I mean, could you imagine she's found in a, in a pet cemetery? She's burned, and then her brother JJ is buried not far away from where his sister is found. Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, uh, tonight has the latest now in this case because prosecutors want to do some testing of some evidence. Let's take a listen. Less than six months before Chad and Lori Daybell's death penalty trial, the prosecutors are fighting for more testing of DNA. The clincher is that this testing would consume the entire sample of evidence and not leaving enough for the defense to have its own experts independently test those items for DNA. And the items at issue may send chills down your spine in the motion. Prosecutors are asking the judge to allow them to test the following items. Hairs on duct tape found inside this body bag used to transport the remains of J.J. Vallow. Ridge detail or fingerprints on the adhesive side of tape associated with J.J.'s body. Swabs of that tape. Small dark spots on the handles of a shovel and pickaxe recovered from a garage or barn, swabs from fingernails from JJ's right hand obtained during his autopsy. Now, this is the second time the prosecution has made this request from the judge. Prosecutors originally requested consumptive testing in April 2021 before the couple was indicted for murder and Lori's case was put on hold due to her competency. At the time, their attorneys did object on several grounds and will likely again object this time asking the judge to not allow any testing on remaining DNA samples until the defense can obtain half of all the samples for their own testing and to allow the defendant's own DNA expert to go directly to any lab to document the process. Lori and Chad, of course, face multiple counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of Lori's children, Tylee and JJ and Chad Daybell's first wife, Tammy Daybell. Up next, the parties will likely schedule hearings to take up this matter and other pending motions from the defendants before their death penalty trial scheduled for January 2023. Reporting for Court TV, I'm Janely Painter. So what is this testing like? How um, important is it? What will it reveal? What are some of the limitations on what you can find out? I need some experts tonight. Got two incredible ones joining me tonight. In Jacksonville, Alabama, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, former senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, and of course, the host of the Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan. And joining us in Oceanside, New York, Professor Emeritus of Forensic Science at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Dr. Lawrence Kobolinski. 
Great to have you both here. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start, let's take a look. I just want to take a look at the, the picture of the backyard uh, of Chad Daybell, just to remind folks kind of what it's like. And my first question is going to be um, some of the challenges when you are getting the evidence from an environment like this. It's a backyard, the burial site for Tylee Ryan, right next to the, the burn pit and pet cemetery. And then you've got JJ, uh, her brother, who's over to the side, um, was not burned like uh, uh, Tylee was. Justice Scott Morgan, I'll begin with you. What are some of the challenges uh, just in dealing with this environment to try to extract that forensic evidence? Well, I think that the most important issue here is taking care. You have to be very, very careful because these uh, these remains are very fragile, particularly uh, Tylee's. Let's reflect back to what the detective had alluded to when he was witnessing the evidence response team at, uh, at the scene. Uh, he had stated that when they had begun to excavate this burned area, uh, there were fragmented remains in there, and that's really all that they could appreciate. They had to do extensive testing in order to verify the ID of Tylee. Um, and so that would mean that she, and of course she was subjected to intense flame. That would mean that it would have taken a considerable amount of time to render down those remains to that point. So if you're looking for evidence of injury, that's gonna be very difficult to assess and also, I hate to say it, Ben, but this term dismemberment has come up. And so that would be a matter of examining particularly the leading edges of the bony fragments because they're getting that from somewhere, I don't know where, as opposed to say heat fractures that would splinter the bone or the bones being snapped traumatically. When you're talking about dismemberment, you're talking about tool marks. And so it's a very fragile environment where, where Tylee's uh, Tylee's case is concerned. All right, Dr. Lawrence Kobolinski, let's get to what the prosecution wants to do here first. And, and one of the first things that we heard about, hairs on duct tape inside a body bag used to transport the remains of J.J. Vallow. What are the challenges? What are you looking for? And, and what type of testing are you doing? And, and, and what kind of results will it reveal? <clears throat> well, hair analysis is not uh, always the best source of information. Uh, initially, it is uh, looked at microscopically, uh, and you're always trying to do a comparison between a known and an unknown, an exemplar and an evidentiary specimen. And you're trying to uh, compare the morphological features, the structures that you can see under the microscope. However, you can also do DNA analysis uh, if there is a root, you can do the normal, um, what, it, what is called autosomal STR analysis. Uh, and if there isn't a root, you can look at the shaft of the hair uh, and do mitochondrial analysis, mitochondrial DNA analysis. So hair can be very informative. Of course, duct tape is used in a lot of crimes. I mean, people get a piece of duct tape and they do all kinds of things. They tie people up, they cover their mouths, they're all kinds of terrible things are, are duct tape can be used for a lot and so you can also use duct tape forensically because often there are fingerprints on the adhesive portion or even on the reverse portion of the duct tape um, and other trace evidence tends to stick to duct tape uh, fibers uh, from the person committing the crime you know the idea the whole idea here is to determine the identity of the deceased, uh, to determine what caused the death, if that's possible, in an autopsy, uh, and also, of course, to a link the person who committed the act to the victim. So that's really what we're after. And hair is one way of doing it. It's really not the best, but sometimes it can be very informative. People lose hair all the time. Uh, scalp hairs, maybe 100, 125 hairs every day are lost. Of course, from somebody like me, it's probably double or triple that amount. Um, but in all seriousness, 
hair is a very common piece of evidence from a crime scene. And again, fingerprint, uh, fingerprints on adhesive tape, very common. You, you do see that a lot. Sometimes the fingerprints are not useful, but sometimes they are. So uh, there's a lot here when you say hairs on duct tape, that's a lot of information that could glean the, the data that we need. Joseph Scott Morgan, your podcast is called Body Bags. They're talking here about hairs on duct tape inside a body bag. Um, anything else that you'd be looking for? Well, yeah, I mean, any kind of trace evidence that might be a tie back. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about Tylee again. My, my mind always goes back to her, and I'm thinking about uh, accelerant examination relative to anything that was left behind in order to, uh, you know, kind of urge on this fire. Uh, because this is not something, again, that you just simply pour a gallon of gasoline, strike a match, and watch away, uh, walk away. Uh, this, this requires tending vent over a protracted period of time. If the remains are as rendered down as they are saying they are, this would require them to constantly be stoking the fire. And so I know that Lawrence will probably agree with this and you know, our kind of the godfather of our, of our practice in forensics, um, you know, Lacard, every contact leaves a trace. So every time they're placing their hands on these remains and anything of evidentiary value, we talked about these tools or you got a channel did, um, every time something is touched, any time something is manipulated, uh, there is a chance, there's a chance that there will be recoverable evidence uh, in these cases. And of course, you know, when you begin to talk about JJ's remains, uh, that opens up a completely different world. We were able to kind of get a peek into the way he was dressed, his pajamas. Uh, they talked about the socks that he had on and this bag that was covering his head and one of the most striking things uh, relative to him is, uh, and you could really sense it from, from the detective, was the amount of duct tape that was used to bind him. And we don't really know about the binding specifically, but the fact, again, the more you use, the higher the probability is, is that you're going to contaminate that. And if they were able to protect these items at the scene and get them back to the lab in their pristine state, that is in the state in which they were recovered, the higher the probability is that they can harvest evidence off of. And they're gonna need evidence. This case is gonna be an incredible battle inside that courtroom. Yeah. Uh, and you've got other people involved in, in, in addition to the doomsday couple. Okay. Joseph Scott Morgan, Dr. Lawrence Kobolinski staying with us. We're going to take a look at more of this forensic evidence, plus coming up next hour. In Broward County, Florida, day four of the death penalty phase trial of the Parkland School shooter. Prosecutors trying to convince the jury that the shooter should be put on death row and pay the ultimate price for his murder of 17 innocent people. Tonight, we take a closer look at what the shooter did after his mass murder. I saw him sit down, so I just was telling him, you know, like, this is so chaotic. You know, this is crazy, all these helicopters and SWAT cars coming, like, what do you think this could be? And he, um, I don't remember him saying much, but he was just head down, wasn't really talking to me. I don't remember much of the conversation. I'll go to pumpkin.care. The Emmy uh, grabbed a small, sharp instrument and cut down the middle of the black plastic. Okay. Uh, and what did you observe? I observed a small child uh, in red pajamas, red pajama shirt, red pajama pants, black socks, that had the word Skechers in orange across the toes. I also observed a light and blue blanket that had been placed on top of him. It's amazing. You can see the, the sorrow in the eyes of the detective who, who is, is witnessing this discovery of J.J. Vallow. Uh, heartbreaking, to say the least. Tonight, we're talking about some of the forensic evidence in the Doomsday Couple case. We've got two great experts with us, Joseph Scott Morgan, Dr. Lawrence Kobolinski. I want to focus now on uh, some of that tape, um, the ridge detail on the adhesive side of the tape 
associated with JJ's body for touch trace DNA and swabs of tape areas. Uh, Dr. Kobolinski, couple things. One, explain this process and, and, and how revealing it could be, but also the defense wants this, this DNA split in half. And I think prosecutors are saying there's not enough. We can't split it in half. Is there any way that you could have two experts in the same lab at the same time kind of figuring this all out? Does that, does that happen? Let me address that first. Uh, you know, the prosecution always has an obligation to preserve part of the evidence so that a defense expert uh, can do independent testing and come to their own conclusions. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't always a great deal of evidence uh, in a specimen. Sometimes it's very minuscule. Uh, and there are times, many times, where uh, a sample has to be completely consumed. When there is going to be a total consumption of evidence, the prosecutor is obligated to inform the defense attorney so that uh, a defense expert can either be present for the testing or videotape the testing. Uh, and that is a reasonable approach. There isn't an agreement between the defense expert and the state's expert. They don't decide what to do. It's the prosecutor's evidence. But the defense expert can see exactly what happened, critique the way the testing was done, um, create difficulties later uh, when the results have to be interpreted. Uh, and it's a reasonable thing to do when there isn't a lot of evidence available. Somebody's got to do the testing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's got to be uh, even and fair, even handed uh, so that the defense has, you know, equal say. But it is the prosecutor's evidence. Now, in terms of taped areas uh, and fingerprints, uh, you know, there's like I said, duct tape is almost I would call it ubiquitous. Uh, a lot of criminals use duct tape for a lot of different things, uh, one of which is to bind victims. And they often have to handle the duct tape and they get their fingerprints on the adhesive portion. Sometimes they get it on the other side of the duct tape. Um, but it, it's, it's a whole process just to work with duct tape. Uh, to get fingerprints, you know, there's a variety of methods. Uh, dusting, we're all familiar with using uh, fingerprint powders of different uh, colors. Um, depending upon uh, the contrast, you want to create a contrast so you could see the ridge endings. Let me ask you uh, this, though. When you're, when you're dealing with fingerprints and trying to get DNA at the same time from the same samples, can you do that? Or do you have to make a choice, fingerprint or DNA? It's a very, that's a very, very good question. Uh, you go with the gold standard, I think. You know, the one that is more likely to give you uh, identifying results. Uh, and if you see that the uh, ridge endings, uh, the, the pattern uh, of the endings are, are not pristine, they're smudged, they're, they're not going to give you a, a result, you go with the DNA. I mean, sometimes you can't do everything, um, but DNA is just such a powerful technology. Uh, and you could swab the area and extract DNA from that, uh, and it should be pretty much preserved. Um, and I think that's the way to go. All right, Joseph Scott Morgan, we only have about 30 seconds here, but swabs from J.J. Vallow's fingernails obtained during the autopsy. Do you think if you get a result from there, that is our killer? Well, if he's in the presence of these people anyway, it's, you know, that's a more difficult sell. However, if you find things like skin cells that are kind of curled beneath the leading edge of the fingernails, that's going to be significant. At post, one of the things we do is actually do what are called nail scrapings and nail clippings, and all of that is preserved. The question is, when they hauled this guy in and they got all of this, you know, they decided to do this, did they examine him at all for any kind of scratch marks on him? Because that gives you an indication. It's almost like if you think about farmer taking a plow and going over a, an unplowed field, it leaves these kind of furrows and sometimes they're very faint, is that, can you match that up? And anything that they can recover, any kind of biological sample from beneath 
his fingernails is going to be significant. Joseph Scott Morgan, Dr. Lawrence Kobolinski, together on the same show at the same time. This is amazing. Thank you both so much. We'll see you really, really soon. Great to see you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ben. When we come back, time to take a look at the body language of Chad and Lori. What, what are their bodies saying that their mouths aren't? And how about that phone call that they made? What are we hearing between the lines? Body of Evidence, next. On UMGC. Were you able to clearly view Mr. Daybell? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did you observe when you were watching Mr. Daybell? Mr. Daybell was on the phone uh, sitting in the driver's seat. He had the phone in his right hand and was intently continuing looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would look over his right shoulder for a while, break contact, talk on the phone for a second, and then he would look, continue looking back over his right shoulder. Okay. Pretty intently over his right shoulder. So the question is, what was Chad day bell doing welcome back folks and this is the moment where you have chad day bell on the phone with Lori, his wife who's in jail at the time he's free she's in jail and you got the fbi and all local law enforcement digging up his backyard and uncovering the remains of Lori's children jj and tylee but they're on the phone. And what I want to do right now in our body of evidence segment is get some insight into this conversation, kind of reading between the lines with our body language experts. Uh, joining me in Wells, Maine, body language expert, New York Times, best-selling author of You Can't Lie to Me, Janine Driver's with us. You can check her out on TikTok at Body Language Institute. And in Winchester, Virginia, body language expert specializing in micro expressions, Dr. Stephen Langston. Great to have you both back. All right. Uh, see I, you. I, we're going to begin. You're not going to see anyone's body. You're just going to hear the voices, okay, of Chad and Lori. Chad is free. Lori's locked up. They're digging up the bodies. Chad's watching this happen. Let's listen to this conversation. It's, I think that's the last time they've ever spoken. I, I don't, because he gets arrested that day, so I don't know if they've spoken since, if they've been permitted to, you know, make a jail-to-jail -jail call. All right, uh, I'll start with you, Janine Driver. As you listen to that, the dynamic between the two, and the one lingering question we have is, 
do you think she knows the bodies are in the backyard based upon anything in this conversation? Because to me, that's, a, that's, that's an important part of this whole thing. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, she's like, we'll see what happens. And, you know, we'll see how it goes. What's missing here, Vinny and Dr. Langston, is this. Why are they looking at that guy? Why are they looking in the backyard? That makes no sense to me. So the fact that she's not saying it implies to me she knows exactly what they're going to find when they look there. Now, we hear Chad's affect is kind of no affect. And we see that in I, I just have to jump in, Janine. Janine, we've got... Video, um, audio clips are being played. Janine? You know, I don't know if she can hear me. I got to jump in. Uh, if we could pot Janine down, because we've got a bad connection with Janine. Maybe we can get her on the phone. Um, Dr. Stephen Langston, uh, give me your interpretation of what you just heard. Unfortunately, we couldn't... We couldn't under... Could you understand Janine? Maybe you could read her body language for us and tell us what she was saying, because I can't. I couldn't understand. I got to tell you, absolutely what she's talking about is they, they know exactly what's going on. She knows exactly what's going on. You know, the great thing about this is Chad. I think Chad's hilarious in this whole thing because if you look at his podcasts and everything, this guy's this guy's been writing books. He's got a podcast about the doomsday stuff. He's always got something to say. And then here, he has no words. He can't figure out ums, ahs. He's trying to figure out what to say. You heard the testimony talking about him looking back over his shoulder. He sees this world crumbling around, which is why he tries to make, it is not a drastic run for it, but he does try to leave the site there. Uh, she's calling because when she's asking about them seizing stuff, no, he's in the yard. She knows. They also know they're being recorded. So I, I don't think there's a way they can try to say something uh, that's direct. So they're trying to speak between the lines. They know both know what's going on here. They're trying to calm each other down. And Chad's at a loss for words. You don't see him like this that often. And when he's, yeah, this picture you're showing right now, you can see he's a calm cat uh, usually. But at this point, he's kind of losing his thoughts. He doesn't really know what to say because he can see the end coming through there. And... What are your thoughts about the, the little bit of laughter at the end? Like she laughs a little bit and he's got like a little chuckle at the end. You, you know, when you when you look at all that these two have been through, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not thinking like they're normal people. Remember, they're almost putting themselves in this transcendent state. They, they are rising above most humans. You can even hear early like her, her first husband talk about, uh, Charles, when he talks about, uh, Lori thinking she is more, she's transcendent, she's a different person. Uh, I think they're above this. When you see the video of them walking when they're in Hawaii, uh, even then, Chad has these expressions. He's flashing real quick. Every time the reporter asked a question, he flashes the contempt purse lip smile. So he's holding back something, but that contempt showing through saying, I know more than you do. I'm better at this than you do. I know stuff that's going on. I am above this. That's what that contempt really shows. So not only is he trying to hold back what he's trying to say, I think what he's trying to hold back is say, I'm going to tell you all what's going on because I know better, but he can't say it because of the position that they're in. He's trying to do it. So even in that situation where he knows that there's more going on, they know what they're about to find, he sees that coming in. Uh, you know, th these two are chuckling because they're either nervous laughter or they're going to get away with it. It doesn't matter what they find. Let them look because this is such a complex web of problems. I think that chuckle could be contempt as well. Okay, you mentioned uh, them down in Hawaii, and this is way in the beginning of the case. Nate Eaton uh, from East Idaho News. Done an unbelievable job in the story, by the way. Uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. But he's, he's there confronting Lori and Chad. This is at the point where everyone in the world is like looking for their kids, ex for her kids, except for Lori and her new husband. Let's take a look at that now. Lori, Nate Eaton with East Idaho News. Can you tell me where your kids are? Where are your kids? No comment. No comment? They've been missing for four months. You have nothing to say? You're over here in Hawaii? Where are your children? Yeah, why don't you just give us a comment? Just tell us where they are. Chad, where are Lori's kids? What happened to Tammy, Chad? Can you tell us what happened to Tammy? Why have you guys been in Hawaii for so long? Listen, just tell people what's happening. There's people around the country praying for your children, praying for you guys. Why don't you give us answers? That's great. That's great. That's great that they're praying for you. 
All right, we, I think we've got Janine Driver back. Janine, your thoughts about uh, Lori and Chad in Hawaii being confronted by Nate Eaton? Oh, my gosh. All right, thanks for welcoming me back. Sorry, there's tornado warnings up the street here over in New Hampshire, so things are a little chaotic. Um, her chin, Lori's chin, goes up when he, she is told, hey, your mother, Lori, has put 20K towards finding your children. All of a sudden, her chin goes up. And when our chin goes up, I want you to think you're in a meeting. This is pride and confidence. Our, our military soldiers, when they salute us, go up, right? This is this pride in our country. However, it can also be a splash of arrogance. So we see that with Chad, and I'm sure Dr. Dr. Langston here, my good buddy, he probably noticed as well, Chad's lips are locked the whole time. And I like to say, when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. And before I turn it back to you, Vinny, and, and over to Dr. Langston, what I was saying earlier in that earlier piece is just simply this. She's like, let's see where it goes. We'll see what they find. And he's like, yeah, we'll see how it goes. This is suspicious behavior. Um, when someone is talking in a weird way, I want people to start paying attention. I dated a guy once, Vinny, and I said, I know you're out with a married woman tonight cheating on me. And he goes, I was not. And how would an innocent person be responding anyway? I go, well, if you were innocent, you'd just simply respond. So pay attention to the language people use. It reveals more than you may think. All right, Dr. Stephen Langston, your final words about the uh, Hawaii chat and confrontation. And, and, and Nate Eaton also confronted about Tammy as well. You, you know, there's two things that stand out when I watch that video. It's not uncommon for couples like that to start mimicking each other's body. They start adapting behaviors. And you can notice the gait as they're walking. They're almost walking in the same pattern. Their hands are swaying in the same pattern. So they're definitely aligned. They're of one mind up there. And that's really common in tight relationships. Here's the thing that keeps getting me about all this. Why not just say, here's where my kids are? Right. I can tell you right now, Vinny, I got four kids. I know exactly where they're at right now. I can tell you it's not impossible to go back and say they're here, here, here. But she is not answering a very simple question. She does show she's showing no emotion. And in the simplest things, all you have to do is go back and say, here's where my kids are. Why is it that hard? So what is she holding back? Why are we not finding out the answer to this? And even when he's talking about the work that their families are doing, she says, that's great or that's good or something like it's such a dismissive thing these two think they are above the rest of us they think they're going to get away with it because i truly believe if you look at a lot of the early statements and such they were doing these two think they're on a holy mission they think this is something that's intervened they are at a transcendent level they're above us all and they're going to get away with it so they're walking saying nothing purposely this is the way that they are protecting each other when we come back, we've got more with Janine Driver and Dr. Stephen Langston. We're going to take a look at um, Lori Vallow at the time on the day her brother shoots and kills her husband, Charles. Wow, that video, pretty powerful. Um, plus, coming up in the next hour. In Monterey County, California, the disappearance of Kristen Smart 26 years ago. She was a student at Cal Poly when she disappeared. She has never been found, but now her classmate, Paul Flores, is on trial charged with her murder. We have the latest. But Paul and Ruben did not join the search. Ruben Flores would tear down missing posters of Kristen Smart and call her a dirty slut, all while her corpse was decomposing under his deck. to your room, meaning yeah, the room you're room staying, staying in? in? Yeah. Okay, and you brought your uh, brought a gun yes. with you? Yes. Do you always yes. bring a gun? I have a concealed carry always. Okay. Just to be safe. Hi, who are, are you? Hi. Okay, just stand over there for just a second, guys. Okay, welcome back to our Body of Evidence segment. That was Lori Vallow's brother, Alex Cox. She wasn't a daybell yet. Soon to be, but not quite yet. Her husband, Charles, was just shot inside the home by her brother who was sitting on the curb who claimed self-defense. Well, that day, uh, Lori shows up. You just saw her there showing up on the body cam, and she speaks to police on the body cam outside the home, 
and then speaks to them at the police station. And we're going to take a look at that video with Janine Driver and Dr. Stephen Langston, who are still with us, our body language experts. So let's take a look now. Again, this is Lori Ballow. The day that Charles has been shot and killed by her own brother. Let's watch. Let me get your information. Does your husband live here or no? No, oh. this is his thing. Gotcha. Okay. You guys know that. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Let me just get your do you have a driver's license quick? Yeah, I can just grab it. What does your middle initial stand for? Uh, Noreen. Noreen, N-O. V-A-L-L-R. What's a phone number for you, Lori? You live, you know, not, not in Santana. This is your home? Right, gotcha. right. Gotcha, okay. We just moved in here. Gotcha. How long have you guys lived here? Okay. How long have you lived here? Like three weeks. Oh, geez. Yeah. Okay. That's why the neighbors don't know us. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, hi, neighbor. Sorry. <laughs> Are you working at all? Uh, no. Okay. And uh, you're still about five. Yeah, Kylie told you she's at me with that bad and blah, blah, blah. And so Kylie, I guess, I don't know if she swung at him or what, but he, like, grabbed the bat from Kylie and then went to, like, hit Kylie with the bat. It was... And I was right there, they were right there, and my brother grabbed him from behind, mm -hmm. like, just to stop him from hitting Tylee. Did you go like this, like, he grabbed him, like... Yeah, from behind, like, uh -huh. just kind of to pull him back. Uh -huh. And then um, they got into the thing, he's hitting him with the bat, and they're on the ground, like, grappling around or whatever. And then, um, uh, I mean, that was all... And he... Quickly. <laughs> and he hit your brother with the bat while they were grappling and stuff? Yeah, I, yes, he was hitting him with the bat, like swinging the bat, you know, back and forth, and they were kind of like on the ground, and I was like freaking out trying to go around, knowing JJ was in the car, Yeah. right, and so then he got up, and he had the bat like this towards me, and I was going around the other side to try to just get out of his range where he couldn't hit me. I didn't. All right, uh, you each have about 45 seconds, unfortunately, we're a little short on time. Go ahead, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Langston first. Well, I, there's two things that stand out on this one, too. The, the rapid eye blinking on there, right? On a, on a normal stage, you're blinking 15 to, to 12 to 15 times per minute. Uh, in that little segment right there, I counted about 20 blinks in about 10 seconds of the time there, that rapid eye movement. I also was noticing some of her story, her body language, uh, when she was talking about the swing of the bat, everything was done. Uh, with that, uh, well, I guess it'd be her with her right hand, uh, which isn't quite where the story's going, especially if this kind of tussle was going on. You would have been more into that story, would have seen more of her body language like that. And again, very calm for what she just went through. The lack of emotion, something's uh, definitely not right with that story. Janine Driver. Hey, Vinny. I think she forgot to tell her forehead to act like this was unexpected, right? There's no forehead activity here, whether she's talking to the police or when she's being interrogated. She forgot to let her face in on a secret. Pretend you actually give a care, a, a, a little teeny minute bit about your ex-husband dying here. Keep in mind her brother Alex Cox mysteriously dies five months and one day after her ex-husband. So we're looking for not only body language, we're looking for what I like to call verifiable facts. It's Absolutely. Fact died mysteriously. We're, at it, we're out of time, Janine. We will do it again really soon. Thanks so much. We'll be right back.